guest tonight is Jean, how you say it? Bonnet. Bonnet. She has written a book on the life of Little Rose Fair. I've known about Little Rose Farron since I was, oh, let's see, it must be 19 years old. It's way back. And I've always wanted to have a program on Little Rose Farron. I want you to, uh, to welcome Jean Bonnet because she's come all the way from Canada, Quebec, to share with us uh, this new book she wrote on uh, Marie Rose Farron. And so please welcome our guest. Let me explain first that, that uh, Rose Farron was a stigmatist. What does that mean? Well, it means that she had the wounds of Jesus, just like St. Francis did. Uh, those of you that are Catholic know Padre Pio, and just like he did. So I, I, would, I would like you to give us some background on this, on this beautiful woman who sometimes was very, very misunderstood. Yes, but tell, tell us about this great saint of God. Uh, you would, would you like to know when she was born? And oh, I give me the whole after. thing. Okay. <laughs> She's a little Canadian woman, a little Canadian girl, the 10th of a family of 15. And she was born in uh, St. Germain of Grantham, which is about two miles from Drummondville, which is between Montreal and Quebec, in the province of Quebec, in Canada. She was born there from these uh, the very Christian and very uh, wonderful people, parents, Mr. and Mrs. Farron. They were not rich, but they were full of, uh, of Christian love and very, very cheerful people and very devoted to their family. So they uh, lived there. She was baptized in the uh, St. Germain of Grantham. I went to see the, uh, the church where she was baptized. And, they, and then at, um, she was dedicated since the beginning the Lord had chosen her as a, a special uh, spouse of his, a, a mystic soul. He had chosen her particularly, so much so before her birth, because when she was born, the 24th of May, 1902, her father had gone to the fields in May. They were preparing, plowing the fields and all this. And the mother went into the, the uh, stable to uh, water the, give water to the animals. And here she has a hemorrhage. So Mother Farron had little Rose in the stable, mm. like Jesus. Mm. Then at the age of three, Jesus appeared, Rose had a vision. At uh, three? At three. She wow. saw this young, this little boy with a, a, cr a cross on his shoulder. And that marked her, that really made an impression on her. And she think about it and talk about it often and say he had, um, he had uh, uh, the name escapes him, a sadness in his yeah. eyes. He, he, fell, he, he had that cross and he had sadness in his eyes. So that really impressed her. Then at the age of seven, but in the meanwhile, she'll gone to the States, but at the age of seven, the Lord showed her a special supplication for sinners, which she's recited to the end of her life, and which is uh, copied. And uh, with her father from Montreal has asked her where it came from. And uh, she said, well, it uh, was given to me. And it was Jesus who had given it to mm. her. And the Sisters of the Precious Blood in Montreal found it one good morning on their table in the parlor. And that priest said, the sisters uh, of uh, the precious blood said they found it. So little Rose was very much amused because she knew who had taken it there because she had uh, by location, you see. At and seven? She, um, no, she, uh, she, not when she received oh, it. This oh, is, okay. was when the, uh, she was about 25 oh, at yeah. the time when okay. that priest asked her about that special yeah. supplication. But you see, she was uh, pre, uh, pre uh, she was predestined. She, pre, uh, yes, yeah. that's it. Yeah. And um, but at the age of four and a half years old, the family, the fa father being a blacksmith, and um, the work being lessened because less horses and all this, so that they decided to come to the states because there were 
half a million of Cana French Canadian people coming to the New England states on account of lack of work and the government did, didn't really want to keep them, you see, by promoting mm -hmm. uh, uh, positions and uh, work so that they left and they went to the states. And that was one family who went. They went to Fall River, Massachusetts. And uh, there, Rose was uh, four and a half years old. So she, she was normally uh, strong and full of pep, but very, very, always very obedient very obedient to her mother and very uh, uh, loving God, uh, remarkably loving uh, to God. So uh, the, she, uh, at 12 years of age, she decided that she wanted to go into the, uh, the order of um, uh, precious blood, which is uh, to adoration. So she decided to go and uh, take care of the children of a lawyer. Uh, for a year to prom to get funds so that she could pay mm -hmm. to for the re entry and be accepted so and do something for her parents too so that that w that uh, year her father was uh, working and everybody was going to school so she took dinner to her father she missed the trolley car and she got cold because it was a slush in the spring you know so that um, she uh, had a terrible fever that night and next morning, her um, right arm, her right hand, and her left arm were paralyzed. Mm. That's how her life started to be more bedridden, you know. She had to mm -hmm. stay at the house. And there, she, it was an awful um, trial for her because she wanted, to be, she wanted to be educated. She wanted to go to school. And she saw that with her sickness, she could not go. So she felt depressed at times and cried because she could hear the children leave for the month of Mary, for example. Yeah. Her sisters, she had uh, 11 sisters, and they were going to, um, uh, and they were laughing and singing and so happy. And she was there uh, seeing that the Lord uh, had forgotten her in a way. And, and as much as she loved him and all this, she, she couldn't figure it out. But then she started, she, it got worse. She, she had to walk with a cane. Then crutches and all this and at 17 years of age she was bedridden she was in bed all the time mm. but there was a priest there father Gutzi, who was very much interested in her he was the um, in, in the parish where she was in fall river and he uh, showed he would show a catechesis and come and give her and he noticed that the day after he had given her a lesson she knew more than he did about it so that kind of uh, rang a bell you know and, um, and he always followed her, and he showed her to accept her sickness, her condition, and even to, to go beyond, to, to, to ask God to... Uh, so she had, when she, at 22 years of age, the day she was 23, she left Fall River, but she had already uh, started flagellation. Mm -hmm. She had been, and then she was on the way to, to sanctity, you know, she was very much... Uh, in love with God, and she knew her vocation. When, when did she get the, the stigmata, though? The stigmata? Well, you see, she had the flagellation that was in Fall River. And Father Gutzi said to, his mother, to her mother, um, don't say that to people, because those are stigmata. But if they hear about that, they, and the, the, the family didn't know what stigmata meant no. at all. So he said, if the, fa if the people know that, you have so many daughters, they won't want to marry your daughters. You won't find a, a son-in-law. That's Nothing the way. like being practical. Yes, he was very practical in that sense. So that he, he had told her that. So that um, uh, he told the mother. So they didn't mention too much but about you have those. But you'll have to uh, explain before we, we take a break what is flagellation. They won't know what, yes. what that means. Well, you see, she had like slashes. Like somebody who uh, flagellation is when our Lord was... Uh, oh, was in the, on the pillar there, attached to the pillar, and he was lashed with uh, with whips. those whips and with pieces of metal at the end. Something horrible to, for our sins. He, he suffered so much, and that you see, little Rose had that stigmata, so she was full of covered with with those whip, uh, you know, those thick, about a quarter of an inch. Uh, swollen there all over yeah, the body yeah. that's the that's how it started 
But when she was, she came to Woonsocket, I met her, I was 11 years of age. And I went to her house because my grandfather's house was right two houses from hers. So my aunt had been invited by Mrs. Farron and we went in, I went in to see Lil Rose. Well, I saw her feet. At that time, she already, her feet were just like you see in the book. Yeah, yeah. They were like little distorted little uh, lame feet, you know, looking so, and they were so, so sensitive, so she suffered so much from her feet that her father had made a cradle. Like we, when I was a nurse, we yeah. used to have cradles for people who burned themselves so the, the covers of the bed would not touch them, not to hurt them. Well, she had those, her father was a good carpenter and he made this cradle so that the, the covers of the bed, uh, the, the blankets did not touch her feet. They were so sensitive. Oh, we're gonna be back with more about Rose Fair in, in just a minute. If you'd like more information on how to get EWTN on your cable system, write to EWTN Marketing, Irondale, Alabama 35210. We'll get information to you on how to get the Eternal Word Television Network on your cable system. Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We're back with uh, with Jean Bonnet, and we're talking about Rose Farron, and and here's a, a picture of Rose Farron on this book called Astigmatis, Marie Rose Farron. Uh, Jean, you you said uh, she was sad and uh, sometimes and how did how did she get over this period of sadness? Uh, Mother Angelica, this is Father Gautier visited her regularly, and he showed her the value of suffering, and her love of God increasing. That's how she uh, that disappeared completely, and she was always she was a very cheerful person naturally. And she was smiling and laughing, that sense of humor, something uh, out of this world. Very intelligent, very serene, a beautiful woman. She'd ask our Lord when she, uh, as we come later, we say she had uh, a lot of, um, uh, of uh, she went into ecstasy. That is, she talked to our Lord. She had all the uh, the the heaviness of a mountain, and she had all the the. the uh, they couldn't lift her, could they? Oh no, they couldn't lift her at all. They said the priests have said that she was like a mountain. She was so heavy, and so hard. You know, so, so it was. It's the the signs of uh, of a person who is in ecstasy talking to our Lord. They go out of this world nearly. It's uh, it's it's a special feature that uh, hard to handle. It's hard to. And then she'd um, uh, at that time they always could tell whether she was in she was to, uh, she was out in ecstasy or not, by the weight and by the Father Boyi, who was her, her uh, director. So um, she, um, she uh, as you, uh, you asked me if she was... Uh, I forgot what I asked you. Um, <laughs> let's see. We, uh, We're both in trouble. Yes. <laughs> well, when you, you see, when she, was in, uh, when she was in ecstasy, well, she had those, uh, those phenomena. Of uh, of heaviness and but all she this. must have had some fear at, uh, 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 of all of this. I mean, she was only what uh, 12, 14, 15 years old. Well, and even in when she was in her twenties, I mean, that's mm -hmm. a young girl to be to be given all of that grace. Mm -hmm. Did she have in, uh, in no, your knowledge she any had kind no of fear? She loved God, and um, um, as a, a testimony is given, a man or who said to Rose, I even hear that you, you see our Lord. She said, yes, well, I'll have you see something too. And she talked to our Lord and he, he saw 
the, the Lord coming into his patio, and when he, he, sin, he didn't have the grace, apparently it's a special strength that's given only mm -hmm. to a person that's uh, entitled to it. But he didn't have it, and he <laughs> saw that he was... And Rose told him after that, she said, you, you'll never come as close to dying as that time. But you, the scared, Lord didn't he? want you. He yeah. was scared, scared to death. <laughs> but she never, she never was scared to death. She was always happy. Sometimes it took a little time, and she make an effort to sit up, and she'd say she was with her director, and they, 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 that's how Father Boyer explains it. And uh, and then all of a sudden she's with Jesus. So then she's uh, her face. Apparently she was so beautiful do, do in we, ecstasy. Do we know what she what she saw? I mean. Oh yes, she. We can hear her to all she says. One of my a chapter is there as Father uh, Leonard from Montreal tells us what she answered because he had the permission to write it, mm -hmm. and he didn't do it at the start because he didn't realize he was so touched and so impressed. But when he started to write, then you can have an, an idea what, what the Lord, what the Lord tells her. Yeah. And well, well, she had a heroic virtue to, to suffer all of that. What, how did she display this heroic virtue? This uh, heroic did, virtue. I mean, she was, oh, she was very virtuous during all this Very time. virtuous. And she, um, she was so simple, so pure, so serene, so angelic. Everybody would say she was angelic. She had, and she'd ask our Lord continually. That's what I meant to say a, a few minutes ago. She'd say this prayer, give me a smile and give me a, a, a ray of your glory in my eyes so that I will not be um, repugnant. Uh, I will not repel people. Wow. Because she received a lot of people of all kinds of walks in life. Uh, uh, religious people, uh, priests have come an awful lot, and poor people, and sick, and and she'd uh, receive everybody. She'd be wanting whenever she was well enough. She was not in uh, 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 representing the Passion, for example. Then the house was closed, but otherwise. And so many people were healed, were converted, were directed towards um, religious life or uh, marital life, but very happy. She'd tell people they were pregnant, mm -hmm. women. She knew she had revelation. She had a lot of charisma. Uh, she had bilocation. She had, um, uh, she t spoke in tongues. She spoke the, the language of our Lord, of Jesus, in Ara Aramean. And then she, had, she uh, gave prophecies. She gave revelations. And as far as personally, uh, she knew Eight years before that I, uh, I would marry my husband, our Lord would tell her that, the things that had to do with her friends and her uh, people she knew well. And uh, then she knew seven years before she died that she was going to die at 33 like Jesus. And she, uh, the, uh, Jesus asked her, he said, do you think it's too long for seven years more? She counted on her fingers seven. So that gave her 33 years of age, and she did die the 11th of May, 33, at 33, in 1936. So there she said, no, my Jesus, it's not too long. I would live a 100 years to go and live with you for eternity. Well, her cause for canonization isn't up yet, is it? Uh, the cause is not open yet because in Providence, the uh, you know, there was a question, nationalist question between the, uh, at, at one time, there for schools between the, and of course people went too far, there was uh, excommunication, 56. That's where our Lord asked her every Sunday morning, she started to suffer the passion from five in the morning throughout the masses of Sunday. And there were so numerous in Woonsocket, masses were 45,000 people on 50,000 inhabitants in Woonsocket. Mm -hmm. So she would suffer from five in the morning till 12. The, she would suffer the passion. She was in pain, something in agony. And that started uh, that way. Then she went into uh, every week. It, uh, every Thursday night, around midnight, she'd start, her wounds would start to open, and she would bleed and bleed. And uh, the, 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 the son, uh, the, uh, Bill, the brother of Rose, the younger brother, uh, would uh, describes it. And he said his mother would uh, have to 
put big uh, towels because it would squirt on the, the blood would ooze on the walls and everywhere. And then she uh, the feet, the hands, the crown of thorns, three quarters of an inch of blood under her eyes. And she represented- That's all during the Passion. The Passion. And she represented the holy face of our Lord. My, uh, Bill says, I was so surprised once to come in to see my sister and to see it was not my sister anymore, it was Jesus in pain. Mm. And then, so she, that lasted and she bled that way for four years, just about. And she, she accepted those uh, stigmata bleeding, but people came to see them and that was putting her on the throne, you know. Yeah. And she was so afraid of pride that she asked our Lord to remove them, to let her have the, 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 the sufferings and more but to remove the outward signs. And he, uh, she said uh, that he was very reluctant at accepting, uh, at, at giving her uh, uh, a, a, request, yes, yeah. a request, but, she, uh, but he did. And the first Sunday, uh, the first Friday of, um, after the month of July, Precious Blood in August, the first, uh, uh, the first day of August, everything disappeared for three, the last three years. Of her life? Of her life. And that's oh. where she was persecuted, you see. She oh, lost yeah. all her friends that came for her. Yeah, for well, probably show. that's why our Lord hesitated to, give, to do that, because... That's why. Yeah. He knew that she would have no proof whatsoever. No. But, uh, but you see, he's the one who's doing... She's known the world over. She's the patron saint of China, because the, the, the Jesuits say that. And there's, uh, there's testimonies there. I worked in a book where there's 2,600 pages of testimonies taken by Father Palm. Rose appeared after her death, and she told her mother to give him the, the uh, crucifix she had had in her hands for uh, 11 years, and she had died kissing it. Wow. That it would do more good in China than in, in the, the, uh, the States. So well, that we're going to have to stop a minute, and I've got to give a Bible study, and then we'll yes, be back yes. with phone calls for okay, you fine. in just a minute. Yes. Saturday evening, celebrate the liturgy with the Passionist Fathers of New York as they offer the holy sacrifice of the Mass. The Mass, Saturday at 8 p.m. Eastern on EWTN. I got so interested in Rose Farron that I forgot to pick out a scripture. So I just opened up to St. Luke here, so we'll just see what he says. Well, let's look it up, uh, St. Luke here, uh, 10th chapter, how's that? And we'll look at verse 6. It says here, when you go to a house, say, this is the Lord's words, not mine, peace to this house. Have you ever done that? I don't think I've ever done that. That's not a bad idea. You wonder why would our Lord walk in a, in a house, maybe a friend that you know, and you say, peace to this house. And he says, if a man of peace lives there, your peace will go and rest on him. If not, he will come back to you. Uh, you, you know, it, that's a strange kind of sentence. But, but it's, it's a lot of common sense in it. Let's pretend I come into your house and I walk in the door and I say, peace be to this house. You're all at peace. 
Well, then, the very fact that I have said, peace be to this house, something would happen to you because in your heart you're at peace. But if I came into a house where everybody would just... Uh, just arguing and quarreling and fighting and fussing and fuming. And I came in and said, peace be to this house, you'd get more angry. So, ah, the secret is my peace would return to me. That never happens. If I walked into your house and I said, peace to this house, and you're all in the, mad in the middle of a battle, and you'd be angry because I even said it, your husband would say, well, you can't have peace in this house with this witch around here. And the wife would say, with this baboon around here, who could have peace? All right, my peace would have to come back to me. That's what the Lord says. But I don't think it would. I'd say, ooh. Well, then I would begin to take sides, wouldn't I? And I'd say to the husband, what are you doing, you baboon? Excuse me, what are you doing? To this poor woman, I would take sides. I would begin to choose one over the other. And what would happen to me, huh? My peace would go. But the Lord is saying something extremely interesting. Maybe that's why I didn't figure out what to say tonight. Maybe this is what he wanted me to say. That I should not lose my peace if you've lost yours. Now, that's really something. He said, let your peace come back to you. Huh. He said, stay in the same house, taking the food and drink they have to offer. A laborer deserves his wages. Do not move from house to house. But whenever you go into a town where they make you welcome, eat at what is set before you. I mean, whether you like it or not, eat it. Cure those who are sick and say the kingdom of God is near. If anybody came into your house and did those things, you'd think they were nuts. But you shouldn't think that way. That's the way of Christianity. Oh, now here's something real cute. He said, but whenever you enter a town and they do not make you welcome, Go out into the streets and say, we wipe off the very dust of your town that clings to our feet. Now, can you imagine me? <laughs> I go to a few towns that don't welcome me. And I would go right there in the middle of the square, and I would take my feet, and I would just shake them like that, and say, may the dust from this town remain with you. Keep it. And then say, you can be sure the kingdom of God is very near. I tell you, it's not, it's not going to go as hard on Sodom and Gomorrah as that town. You know, that's an awful serious thing for God to say. But in both instances, the strange part of it is that my peace must return to me. So you don't want me in this town? I'll shake the dust. You know what? I don't want your dust either. You dust can remain with you. But I shouldn't lose my peace. You know, a lot of you are having so many problems with your children. They're not your problems, but they're your children, and you've lost your peace. You have no peace, which means I do not release the people I love to God. I do not release the problems I have to God. I do not release those I love to God. I don't. Because whatever is wrong with them becomes wrong with me. And I, I can't love them and pray for them and care for them and intercede for them and still keep my own peace with God. That's the secret and the difference between a good person and a saintly one. I hear so many people crying and crying and crying and crying. But they don't have a problem. You say, well, Mother, you've got to be compassionate. Oh, sure. That's a part of it. But you don't lose your peace when you're compassionate. Because a compassionate person trusts in the Lord. 
it's nice to be empathetic where I cry with those who cry, I laugh with those who laugh, but that doesn't take away my peace anyway. In no way. Because the peace I have with God is something between God and myself. Nothing or anyone. St. Paul said that. Shall persecution take away my love or my peace or, or trials or famine or what? Nothing, he said, can separate me from the love of God. But if you examine your life, you'll see quite a few things separate you. And most of them are none of your business. I like that. A lot of the things we get upset of are somebody else's business. Not yours. Pray for them. Love them. Be patient with them. But don't give them your peace. Let your peace remain. Then you'll be able to give them peace. If your peace does not remain, then you just become part of the problem. That's the problem in our lives. You know, these little passages in Scripture, we, we read awfully fast. And sometimes uh, we, we miss the message in our daily life. It's a very important message in our daily life. That you and I must always retain the peace that comes from the Lord within my own soul. I can listen to a person for hours and all their complaints and all their problems, and some are very deep, deep, sorrowful problems, and be very empathetic, but I cannot lose my peace because that's something between my God and myself. Only then can I be of help to you. If I become part of your problem, I, I, I'm no help to you at all. So think about it. Look at um, Luke 10, 6 to 16. Luke 10, 6 to 16. And see if perhaps you're doing that. You've lost your peace when well, you should retain it and pray for your brother and love him. We'll be back in just a minute. Hi, boys and girls. My name is Angelo, and I have a surprise for you. Many of you already know me for watching me here on EWTN. Now we can have even more fun learning about our Catholic faith with the new official Little Angelo coloring book. This book is loaded with surprises, including a prayer page and a special fold-out poster of yours truly. Just send a $2 donation to Little Angelo Coloring Book, EWTN, Irondale, Alabama, 35210. Each evening on EWTN, pray for the intercession of our Blessed Mother and meditate on the mysteries of our Lord's life on the Holy Rosary. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Queen of the Holy Rosary, you have deigned to come to Fatima to reveal to the three shepherd children the treasures of grace hidden in the Rosary. The Holy the Rosary, evenings at 9.30 p.m. Eastern on EWTN. We that by meditating on the mysteries of our redemption. You know, we're, we're back with uh, our good, wonderful guest, uh, Jean Bonnet, Bonnet, tonight. But I want to explain before we take your phone calls. Because I know some of you are just saying, what in the world are we talking about? Well, there are many people in the world. I've often thought that there are many people throughout the, throughout the centuries, uh, every century has had its stigmatism. Our first that we know of for sure was St. Francis of Assisi. And there have been many, you know, Teresa Neumann, and, and there have been uh, uh, Padre Pio, and even Catholic, the great Saint Catherine of Siena, who had the stigma. And that means that they suffered the very wounds and the very pain that Jesus suffered. Not in the same way, because they're finite creatures. But the purpose of this is to make reparation for all the sins in the world, and a constant reminder to us of the, the action of God upon the soul and to make reparation for all the sin, the many, 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 many sins in the world. And so many of them suffer, flagellation, I mean, they, 
on their body appears these terrible wounds of Jesus. Some had the crown of thorns. A woman I knew, Mrs. Wise, had that and the stigmata, and, and they bleed every Friday on the anniversary of our Lord's uh, death and crucifixion. And I know it's a mystery. It is a mystery, and, and that's, uh, it's, it's something that our faith must accept, but there's no way and, and, uh, f for us to understand why God permits this, but it is always for our edification, and these people have uh, have a hard time with it, but we shouldn't because God is powerful. And it doesn't mean you lack faith if you have a hard time believing it, but it does mean, I think, that we need to understand the power of suffering and the power of the Lord's crucifixion and that there's always somewhere, somewhere in the world, someone who goes through this agony constantly. We have a phone call. Hello? Hello, Mother Angelica. And where are you from? I'm calling from Chicago Ridge, Illinois. And I what is your question? I have a question for Ms. Bonham. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know if Little Rose has been considered venerable, and if so, uh, is there somewhere we may obtain a personal prayer card, and also the priest that attended her while she was still alive, is he still living today? And I'll hang up and wait for your answer. Is there a prayer card for, for her um, being uh, considered venerable? There's a novena made by a director, spiritual director, Father Boyer, who was a specialist in mystic from Washington and very highly appreciated priest, who was a spiritual director. And he made, uh, a, he uh, prepared this uh, with the imprimatur of his own bishop. Mm -hmm. And um, this has always been uh, used for a novena. Mm -hmm. And uh, all, uh, load, uh, many, many testimonies, a great number of documents were sent to the Vatican oh, years ago. And uh, uh, Father Tappy from um, a, a priest that was uh, at the cause of saints said, uh, received everything and said there was more than sufficient for a cause. Mm -hmm. and all this, but then it's, um, uh, the cause is not open yet, but it's on the verge of being open, though. It is? Oh, yes, oh, definitely. And the Vatican, I've written to the Pope, and I've uh, talked to him about the false decree that's been made against Little Rose, and I said, Sister Faustina had one that you worked to have removed, and the Vatican itself had made it but under false pretend, uh, false reports. Mm -hmm. So we ask, the, the uh, lady of the, the, uh, the world ask you, uh, dear Father, to remove that uh, decree. And Father Palm, the Jesuit, who has been dedicated for Little Rose's cause, has told me, that, has sent to me this publication of the, of the Pope since two years, and it's been printed. He wanted it to be printed in the newspapers. And it said that whoever in the diocese feel that the decree is not just can make a, um, uh, can ask the Vatican to remove it, the cause of saints, the uh, mm -hmm. congregation for cause of saints, and that it would uh, they they will study it very. And I, I the Pope answered me that it, all uh, my requests had been sent to the congregation. Wonderful. If you want a book, mm -hmm. if the people are looking want a book, uh, the address is on your screen. And I, I would encourage you to get this book because it really does manifest uh, the action of God in, in different souls. There are not a lot of people that go through this. I want you to write to Jean Bonnet, 114 Boulevard du... Mm -hmm. How do you say that? Desourdi. Mm -hmm. uh, Cowansville, PQJ2K2H9. Ooh. Are all your addresses yes, like that yes, in Quebec? Yes. And, que and Canada. So we're going to keep it there a little bit and let you uh, run and get a pen some paper. Is that the only place you can get this book? Uh, then there's, the, uh, there's an, uh, the editors. Oh, the editors. But if, if it's a book, sh a book shop who wants a number of books, but it's then... A it is a, uh, the, what press is this? The this is Saint the Paulist. Paul? Oh, but the in, in, in Canada, though. Oh, the Paulist in Canada printed. Yes, because okay. the daughters in Boston, the daughters of St. Paul, are of their community. But I am in Montreal, so that mm -hmm. uh, I have uh, seen the, the, the uh, St. Paul fathers. Well, a lot of people have had uh, a lot of answers to the prayer. We have another call. Hello? 
Hello. Hello, Mother Angelica. Yeah, where are you from? I'm from Mamou, Louisiana. And what is your question? Uh, I have two questions. My first is, what was the title of the small book that you had at the beginning of your show? Mm -hmm. And my second question is, uh, could you explain predestination? I'll hang up for your answer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, the book, name of the book, The Holy Gospel. That's uh, the New Testament. That's what I offered up uh, 